people, the First Nations, the ecosystems, and many of the local economies. Salmon have fundamentally shaped life on the coast. Yet quietly and without explanation, the numbers of salmon in BC are steadily dwindling. Many rivers are already on the edge of extinction. Here, in the world's largest sockeye salmon river, millions of fish are going missing. And many of the few that do make it back to the rivers are dying mysteriously before they have a chance to lay their eggs. Biologist Alex Morton has been following and studying the unusual decline. Full of eggs, eh? Yeah. Th this is strange. You know, we're right on the spawning grounds. This fish has made the whole trip, but she never spawned. She never released those precious eggs. And we're seeing a lot of this. Uh, most of these fish look like they haven't spawned. This pre-spawn mortality is epidemic in the Fraser River. So we're trying to figure out why. The disappearing wild salmon is no small concern. Without them, BC will lose its most iconic species, as well as a culture, a way of life, and its most valuable natural food resource. The race is on to figure out what is happening to the iconic fish which built British Columbia before it is too late. Not so long ago, the Fraser River was the mightiest sockeye salmon river in the world. Hundreds of millions of salmon returned to the tributaries that branched into a vast network of hundreds of rivers and streams, totaling thousands of kilometers in length, that infiltrated the entire southern half of British Columbia with salmon. The mysterious decline in the productivity of the Fraser River sockeye began in the 1990s. With each passing year, the productivity continued to fall. This was blamed on many things. Perhaps the waters were too warm. Maybe the fish were starving out at sea. Perhaps it was overfishing. The Department of Fisheries closed the commercial sockeye salmon fishery, but even that didn't seem to help. Even without the pressure of commercial fishing, the numbers of returning salmon continued to plummet. Something was very wrong. Alex Morton has been working as a biologist in the remote wilderness of the British Columbian coast for over 30 years, watching and studying the decline of BC's wild salmon. This is the problem. This, this farm is just pouring out disease and pathogens, and our wild fish are swimming through it. I know, I've seen with my own eyes what happens to them when they go by. When industrial fish farms moved into her neighborhood, it soon became apparent they were having impacts on the wild fish. The most obvious symptom was a dramatic rise in parasitic sea lice on the tiny juvenile wild salmon, who don't naturally carry the lice. And sea lice aren't the only problem, but you know when these fish have lice on them from the farms, that they're also being exposed to whatever bacteria and viruses are on these farms at the same time. The salmon farm or salmon feedlot is a, a whole different situation. It breaks the natural laws that make salmon move. So they hold 600,000 to over a million fish stationary in one place. This amplifies the waste, but also most seriously, the pathogens. Because it's so easy for viruses and bacteria to jump fish to fish, to mutate, and then explode out of the farm in a billowing cloud. This is the major wild salmon migration route in British Columbia. That's where they put the salmon farms. They're clustered in these little narrow channels. Now, when one of these farms has a disease outbreak, so many viruses come out of the farm that they actually fill the entire channel. And then here come the Fraser sockeye. And they go through this channel and they come out the other end. And when the fish go on, they're contaminated, without a doubt, with whatever is coming out of those farms. So if we just look at the timing of the situation, the Fraser sockeye began to decline in the early 1990s at exactly the time that the salmon feedlots were put onto their migration route. The one run that is not declining is never found in those salmon farms and appears to be going around the southern end of Vancouver Island, and those are the Harrison sockeye. And they have been increasing over the same time period. 
Is it a coincidence that the only sockeye that are doing well are the ones that are not passing close to the salmon farms? The Department of Fisheries and Oceans, otherwise known as DFO, is the agency responsible for the protection of fish in Canada. In 2006, DFO tasked one of their employees, Dr. Christy Miller, to look into the disappearance of the Fraser fish. Dr. Miller heads up a cutting-edge research lab which uses an emerging science called genomic profiling, which gives scientists an unprecedented insight into the life history of a salmon. You know, Dr. Christy Miller, her work, genomic profiling, the way I see it is she makes the fish talk. She, it's like sitting a fish down in the office and saying, how are you feeling? So in all our bodies, we've got these switches that turn on and off in our cells, depending on how, what kind of experience we're having with life. And she found that the ones that died before they spawned had all these switches flicked in their cells, and the ones that lived had a whole different pattern of switches. So she's like, okay, so the ones that are dying seem to be dying of the same thing. Well, that was huge because all the other scientists that tried to figure this out were like, uh, God, they're dying of everything, you know? They, they couldn't figure it out. And um, when she read these switches, they were like leukemia, retrovirus, brain tumor, immune system decay. Um, and she looked at that and went, uh, salmon leukemia. Salmon leukemia is this virus that raged through the salmon farming industry right at the beginning when it went into the Campbell River area in the early 90s. The salmon leukemia virus attacks their immune system so they die of something else. It's a retrovirus like AIDS. And DFO wrote about six papers on it and they found that virtually all of the Chinook farms were infected and that this virus killed 100% of the sockeye salmon that were exposed to it, and they never did anything about it. And as soon as Dr. Miller's work, you know, her compass was all over the place. As soon as her compass pointed at salmon farms, she wasn't allowed to go to meetings. Uh, she wasn't allowed to talk to the media, even when she published in the journal Science. The world's most prestigious scientific journal, Science, published Dr. Christy Miller's findings in January of 2011. It was hailed as some of the most significant new salmon research in a decade. Hundreds of reporters lined up to interview Miller about her findings, but they were all turned away. Dr. Christy Miller is head of molecular science for DFO, one of the top scientists on the West Coast. And when we learned that she had a paper coming out in, in one of the leading journals, uh, there was a lot of interest in, in the media and talking to her. I asked for an, an interview time to be set up, never heard back. So go back to DFO and ask what's going on and there's met with this kind of wall of silence. There's no question that the federal government, with orders from Ottawa, uh, muzzled her and kept her from, from speaking about a science paper which had been published. It's pretty disturbing, I think, when the government starts to mess around with science. It starts to try and shape the picture and try and um, control science in a way like that. I mean, Muslim scientists is not something that should be happening in a, in a great democracy. There were questions about whether or not she'd get funding for continued research. Unfortunately, uh, I guess I can't phone her up and ask her because she can't talk. Dr. Miller, when she began to uh, see a, a strong correlation between these dying sockeye and the salmon leukemia virus, and she read that the salmon leukemia virus was in the salmon farms, she naturally wanted to go test those fish. So in April of 2010, she made a request to DFO to test farm salmon for this virus, but access was denied. She was not allowed to test these fish that are in public waters, uh, releasing their pathogens into the most valuable salmon stocks in this country. And she was not allowed to follow the trail into the pens. To protect the interests of the salmon farming industry, the government allows the farms to keep their disease information confidential from the public and from scientists. There is no way to find out what diseases are on the farms. 
Uh, the fact that the farms won't allow it is pretty suggestive to me. <laughs> um, they're afraid of what will be found. Uh, if they were you know, not concerned, as they claim to be, then they would surely open up their farms and say, come in and test because we're proud of our product and you won't find any issues. Clearly, they, they know that there are issues and they're not allowing testing for that reason. In 2009, fishermen were getting ready for a good run to return to the Fraser River. An estimated 130 million young salmon had left the river in 2007 and were now due to return as adults. 13 million adult sockeye were predicted to return. All signs look good. However, instead of being a banner year, it turned out to be the worst in recorded history. Over 10 million fish vanished without a trace. It was an unexpected disaster. The fishing boats stayed tied to the docks and thousands went without their traditional food supply. The government responded to the public outcry by announcing a federal inquiry into the decline. It was called the Cohen Commission. Well, it was the first ever federal inquiry we've had on any fish species in Canada. We never had a commission on, on the collapse of cod, and uh, that was a huge loss to Canada and, and to the world. Uh, we should have learned a lot of lessons on that. The $26 million inquiry included 150 days of hearings. Many theories were presented about why the fish might be disappearing. Items on the table included overfishing, sharks, water temperature, pollution, and even predatory giant squid. It wasn't until the final days that the inquiry turned its attention to salmon farms. Uh, Dr. Fleming, I'm very interested in your Norwegian experience. As I understand uh, your evidence in Norway, uh, the government in its wisdom has seen fit to recognize that certain uh, fishing rivers or migratory routes for fish are uh, important enough that they should keep salmon farms off of them? Uh, that's correct. And so does that mean the government recognizes a risk to wild fish from fish farms? Uh, yes, there are official statements to that fact. One of those risks is the risk of disease transmission? Uh, yes. The wonder of the Cohen Commission is that they could put senior bureaucrats on the stand who had to be examined, which is not a place they commonly exist. And they were very uncomfortable with that. The possibility of disease affecting the wild sockeye runs has never been a factor for BC in terms of a siting decision. Is that fair? That's a fair comment, isn't it? I couldn't really say because what about you, Mr. Swartfigur? Can you think of a site that's ever been rejected by the federal government because of its impacts on wild salmon migratory routes? No, I can't. At least 10 fish farms approved right in the narrowest channel of dis the Discovery Passage, the narrowest place the wild salmon migrate through. Was that risk considered when they were approved? Wild fish get infections. I'm no expert in fish health, but I th uh, my my belief is wild fish get infections, whether uh, as part of a natural course of fish being in the natural environment. TFO, are they in a conflict of interest? Yeah, I think they're in a serious conflict of interest. They have to, by their mandate, they're supposed to protect wild fish, and, and uh, by their political masters, they're supposed to uh, support the development of an aquaculture industry. In the final days of the inquiry, Justice Cohen called on DFO's Dr. Christy Miller to testify about her findings. For the first time, the public would have a chance to hear Miller speak about her discovery, since her gag order had been imposed. What you found is some sort of new virus. Your leading suspect was uh, salmon leukemia virus. Yes, it was. And if in fact that's the case, this in fact may be the smoking gun for the 2009 declines. It could be the smoking gun. She's doing some fantastic work under very difficult conditions and, uh, you know, in, in conditions where she says she's been intimidated by her managers for reporting on health issues around wild salmon. She felt uh, intimidated about the potential loss of her data if she went public. She felt intimidated uh, in terms of her budget 
And so that was extremely revealing. So while all this was happening, um, Dr. Rick Rutledge was very worried about the river's inlet sockeye because they were in an unexplained decline, a lot like the Fraser sockeye. I had no idea as to why the numbers were so low. I tried to think as the season was winding down what on earth the cause might be. It had to be something new, I thought, because it hadn't happened before as far as I could tell. So I eventually sent some samples in for testing. I remember when he called me, it was a, a dark October night, and he said to me, you know, Alex, are you sitting down? It was like he was going to tell me that someone we knew had died. And he said the tests came back positive for ISA virus in Rivers Inlet smolts. I was devastated. <laughs> you know, I thought, okay, 20 years of trying to prevent this industry from destroying the wild salmon of Canada, and I have failed. Salmon influenza, ISA virus. Most lethal known salmon virus worldwide caused $2 billion worth of damage in Chile. Um, no country wants it. It has spread everywhere in the world where Atlantic salmon are being raised in pens in large numbers by the Norwegian companies. ISA, infectious salmon anemia, the most lethal known salmon virus worldwide. It was first detected in Norway in 1984. At first, the virus seemed benign. But once it incubated in the salmon farms, it mutated into highly virulent and lethal strains, which can kill millions of fish at a time. These deadly strains of ISA spread to new countries by way of egg imports. The industry farms mainly Atlantic salmon, so they must import Atlantic salmon eggs from Europe into the country in which they are operating their farms. When the ISA virus wiped out 70% of Chile's salmon industry, the strain was traced back to Norway. The difference between Chile and BC, though, is that Chile has no native salmon, whereas BC has much to lose, with thousands of runs of five different species of Pacific salmon and entire ecosystems and economies that depend on them. The ISA is sometimes called salmon flu, and so it, it is a bit flu-like, I guess, in its symptoms. Um, but it's like a very, very severe flu, you know, like the, the type that killed millions of people uh, after the First World War. I mean, it's a, it's a very serious flu to which the fish may not be adapted at all. Um, and incidentally, it was that crowding of people into high densities during training camps and so forth and in the trenches in Europe that led to the... Uh, evolution of an extremely virulent form of, of flu virus that killed millions upon millions of people. ISA is like mad cow disease in terms of shutting borders, closing farms. ISA is so important that it's an internationally reportable disease. Most salmon diseases are not, but any country, there's a website you can go to, and any country that has it is supposed to be reporting it, and it's up there. ISA caused $2 billion of damage in Chile when it hit down there, when a European ISA ended up in Chile. Nobody knows what happens when you introduce a virus into a, into a population that hasn't been exposed to it before. It, it might be totally benign, or it might have a devastating impact like smallpox had in the Aboriginal populations in North America or the, the uh, bubonic plague had in Europe. This is something I thought we were, we were working to prevent coming into British Columbia. But uh, my first response was, get out in the rivers. Let's, see, let's have a look around. Let's see where this is. It's the same thing I did when the sea lice, when I found the sea lice in 2001. I just made a net and just went around and started looking at all the fish. Because if you just sit there with that bad news, it, it, it destroys you. Uh, but if you can get out and do something, it, it's a lot healthier. It was late in the season, most of the salmon were already in the river, but we dashed down to the lower Fraser River because we had been getting reports from people down there that there was a massive number of, of salmon dying in the river without spawning. And this uh, big yellow Chinook salmon, uh, a white Harrison Spring, that had ISA virus. This sockeye had ISA virus. This coho had ISA virus. We tested 11 fish in the Fraser River, a, a, a river of millions and we got it three times. 
It was European strain ISA virus. Alex uh, didn't fool around. I mean, she sent, she decided to send her samples to the lab in Prince Edward Island that is recognized by the World Health Organization as being one of two labs in the world that are entitled to test for ISA with international significance. She also sent it to Dr. Nyland in Norway, who's the leading expert on ISA in the world. So she, she sent these samples to the two people who were the most credible international folks. We gave a press conference. We thought the scientific community should be given the opportunity to engage on this and really figure this out. But <laughs> really, all hell broke loose when we did that. The CFIA came and took our samples and said they were going to run tests, and we were supportive of that. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency contacted me and asked me to turn over all my samples, which I did. They shipped them to the testing lab in Moncton, and uh, they tested them for uh, the remaining samples for the infectious salmon anemia virus. Very quickly thereafter, the CFIA gave a press release as well. The Minister of Fisheries came out and said that all of them were negative, that, that our results were completely wrong. They did a press release basically to refute our findings, to say that there was no problem, there was no ISA. They said everything was negative. I was, I was surprised, and I'm, I'm distressed about it. I, this is a serious matter, and, it, and the government is not taking it sufficiently seriously in my mind. We were standing on a riverbank, actually, listening to it on our cell phones, and I kept waiting for them to address the whole issue, what was hap happening in the Fraser River, what we had found down there. Um, when they kept talking about the ISA findings, they, they fixated on the river's inlet. They never talked about the ISA findings we had in the Fraser River. And with the, the case of the river's inlet sake, those samples were degraded because they hadn't been stored properly. But in the case of the Fraser River samples, these were fresh samples, and they never mentioned them. The minister never mentioned them. They just, they, they treated us like we didn't exist, like this work was not going on. I had been allowed to look at all the Cohen documents prior to this time. I was a participant, a legal participant, and, and, and reading their emails, they were fighting us. Uh, not trying to protect us. This is an internal CFIA email from Joseph Bears to a whole list of people. It says, Khan, it's clear that we're turning the PR tide to our favor. And this is because of the very successful performance of our spokes at the technical briefing yesterday. You, Stephen, Peter, and Paul were a terrific team. Indeed. Congratulations. One battle is one. Now we have to nail the surveillance piece, and we will win the war also. Oh, what war? What, the war against us, the public? <laughs> uh, Khan, who's Cornelius Keeley, comes back, and he says, hey, concentrate on the headlines. That's often all people read or remember. <laughs> it's just, it really, you know... Um, these are the same guys looking after H1N1 and mad cow disease. I, it really does concern me. How dangerous is the ISA virus? I think a measure of that is the fact that Justice Cohen reopened the entire inquiry. The lawyers had gone home. The, the rental of the room was over. You know, everybody was just in the right up the report mode. And he reopened the whole inquiry just before Christmas. All labs that had tested for the ISA virus were invited to speak at the Cohen Commission's ISA hearings. Dr. Fred Kibenji, 
based on Prince Edward Island, heads up one of only two world reference labs for ISA. Dr. Art Nyland from Norway, considered to be one of the world's experts on ISA. Dr. Christy Miller, head of the genomics lab for DFO. And Dr. Nelly Gagne, DFO's reference lab and the lab used by the CFIA to test for ISA. When Nell Gagne, who did the test for them, actually went on the stand, she said she had gotten weak positives, and for her, the results were inconclusive. Were your RT-PCR results inconclusive? We reported them as inconclusive, and in this case, all samples submitted showed extensive to total degradation of RNA. And the problem was the samples were so degraded. You know, now, a year after tracking viruses, I am amazed that we got an ISA hit at all in those samples. They were in a household freezer for months. It's not a negative. So for the federal government to come out and say all the results, test results were negative uh, was uh, not correct. The hearings then turned to the fresher samples that had been tested by the four different labs. Dr. Nyland, uh I'll turn my next set of questions to the testing that you've done. I understand you've tested several batches of What were your results? Did you obtain any positive RT-PCR tests for ISAV in those samples that you tested? Among the first 48, I had uh, one positive. In that testing, we found two positive samples out of 48. We did indeed obtain um, ISA sequence. There's uh, only one lab that didn't find it, and that was the reference lab from DFO in Moncton. And, uh, you know, it turns out they were sampling a totally different segment from everyone else who actually found the ISA virus. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we've got three or four labs that are finding it, and one that's a government lab that's not. You know, you have to uh, pause and, and uh, wonder what's going on, whether they really do want to find it or not. We learned that Dr. Miller was prohibited by DFO from testing for ISA virus, but a salmon farm came to her and their fish were turning yellow and dying and they couldn't figure out why. And she decided to test them for ISA virus, even though she was instructed not to. She wanted to get to the bottom of it. And we did um, identify some positive ISA fish among their fish. Uh, it was decided that we should contact Ottawa about this. And um, so Stephen Stevens in Ottawa was contacted and we basically told um, them the results that we had. I, I don't think that, uh, that um, Stephen Stevens in Ottawa was very pleased that we were doing this testing. Basically, there, there, there was a general feeling that as a scientist, I should not be undertaking research on something um, if I didn't understand the ramifications of, of what the results could, could do. Everyone who's reported the virus has suffered a consequence. Uh, Kabenge got his lab audited. Um, Dr. Nealon had a, an ethics challenge against him. Dr. Miller gets muzzled as soon as her work takes her towards the fish farm viruses. Um, everyone who tries to speak up about these viruses gets shut up in some way. Three leading labs around the world, and including DFO's own lab in Nanaimo, had found ISA. And CFIA's response was to attack those labs. They went in uh, to Dr. Kabenji's lab and tried to attack Dr. Kabenji's credibility and the credibility of his lab and to use all of the mechanisms of government that they could do. Any positive result is a difficult result. People don't easily accept positive results and the, the, the automatic reaction will be try to find some way of explaining it away in some form. So, yeah, that is always the case. It's always there as long as you come up with a positive result. But, you know, we are so confident in our work that we just cannot sweep it under the rug. So we are continuously testing, and once we find a positive result, we report it as it is. Dr. Kabenji had the temerity to announce positive test results, and the result, his lab is being analyzed by you. 
And Mr. Stephen, I suggest to you that the federal government is going to try and take away his OIE certification as a punishment for this. I predict within the next 12 months, Canada will go after his credibility. Isn't that right? I disagree. 11 months later, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency would attempt to strip Dr. Gabenji of his World Reference Lab status, citing results from an audit they had conducted on his lab. If Dr. Gabenji's test results are officially recognized, then BC would be internationally listed as positive for the ISA virus. But if the CFIA's attempt at suspending Dr. Gabenji's status are successful, then BC will remain listed as free of ISA, despite the numerous positive test results. What's happened in Canada is salmon disease has become a federal secret. And the reason we found out at the Cohen Commission is that if this flu virus is confirmed in British Columbia, they say the border is going to close for BC farm salmon to the US and China. Let's say we do find ISA uh, in BC and all of a sudden markets are closed, then there will be no trade, basically. <laughs> That's when a real aha went off in my mind. I'm like, oh, I totally get this now. You guys are hiding this because it's going to damage the industry. It was so transparent and clear. So, you know, this is where you can see the size of the thing that we're coming up against. This is international trade. Our tests are saying ISA virus is here. The province has told these trade partners that it's not here, and these fish are going over the border. Is this spreading ISA down the coast of California? Is this spreading ISA into Washington State? We don't know. They won't accept the results of any other lab than the Moncton lab. They know the Moncton lab uh, is incapable of finding it. The results have to be confirmed through our National Reference Laboratory. And my understanding as of this date, those, none of those tests, and as of this date today, none of those tests have ever been confirmed from our National Reference Laboratory. So there is no evidence to support that ISA is occurring in either wild or cultured salmon in BC. Yes, there is no evidence to support that. Do you think ISA is here? Yes. Well, certainly ISA is here. I clearly believe that there is a, 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 a virus here that is very similar to ISA virus in, in, in Europe. There have just been so many positive tests from, from different labs the sequences that we have detected in samples from British Columbia have all been of European genotype. And so that gives me a pretty high level of confidence, along with all the tests I do every day, that we do not have ISA virus in British Columbia. Dr. Gary Marty is the Provincial Health Veterinarian for British Columbia. He is in charge of monitoring for diseases in both farmed salmon and wild salmon. I don't understand how Dr. Marty has not found it and these other scientists have. I simply don't understand that. Gary Marty is, is in a very difficult situation right now because if he reports that ISA is here, the industry that he works with is going to crumble. Shareholders probably don't know what's brewing here in British Columbia. So, Dr. Marty is under enormous pressure right now because he is the only one that has had access to these fish and looking to them. So much hinges on what he says and sees. Now, when we have no evidence of disease and PCR results that can't be confirmed, the best way to interpret those is that they are false positive test results. Yeah, these are Gary Marty's records. These are Gary Marty's records. These records are um, incidences when the fish farm companies came to Gary Marty and asked him to do specific tests on their fish. So um, here we have a case where Marine Harvest in 2009 submitted fish tissue and they want tests for ISA. Mortality has been increasing. And so in this report where they've asked for tests for ISA, he says, sinusoidal congestion is one of the classic lesions associated with ISA V infections. Okay, but look at this one here. Marine harvest, two days later, 
specific request for a test for ISA. ISA is not supposed to be here, but this company is familiar with, with ISA is asking for a test. Signed by Gary Marty. Yeah, what do you know, Gary Marty? Here you go. One day later, they again sent tissue for ISA test, marine harvest. It was not designed as a public document, so that's one of the unfortunate drawbacks of release of these records to the public. This is another one, I don't know what it means, but sampled four fresh morts with hot guts. Mortality increased over the last two days. You know, in the reports, Gary Marty does say he sees sign of ISA. To confirm the disease, you actually have to have sick fish that have signs in them that are consistent with the disease. But there you go, that's an ISA lesion, that's an ISA lesion. There's a fish that died of ISA lesions. ISA lesions, according to Gary Marty. There were 55 instances where I put in a diagnosis that was described as a classic lesion of the ISA virus. Right, so that's, that's a fact. But then what you do, we also had a specific PCR test that looked for the ISA virus, and all the tests have been negative consistently, no virus. You have to have sick fish, because if this disease were present here, it would be killing large numbers of fish. We're in the river and there's dying fish everywhere. People are very alarmed, particularly this year, fish are vanishing, horsefly, lower shoe swap, rivers of the central coast. Um, we, we go into places and we see more dead fish than alive. Sometimes we can't even see an alive fish. All pre-spawn mortality. There's a lot of fish dying on this coast in the farms and in the rivers. There's definitely something going on. Um, a lot of the rivers we've seen, the fish are dying before they're laying their eggs and they're showing signs of disease. We've seen fish with all sorts of things going wrong with them, like big blisters on their side, and you cut them open and their whole stomach cavity is full of water and blood, and yellowing, pale gills, pale heart, um, lesions in the stomach wall, like red blisters all on the inside of their stomach. Some of them, the flesh has got blisters throughout the whole fish. This, this yellow one, the gills are quite pale, like normal gills should be dark red and fairly clean. And the gills get really mucousy on a lot of these sick fish we've seen, like you can see that it's just completely mucousy, which could be a sign of diseases like ISA as kind of a fish flu, so. How does the fish breathe when they've got that much mucus on the outside of their gills? The, the most distinguishing feature is the really big pop eyes yellowy on the outside with lots and lots of little pinpricks of red all over the outside. The insides, I, not a vet, but I can tell something's wrong with that fish. That's sort of the spleen, but it's all conjoined into one big lump. It just starts bleeding out of the flesh, and then it's all throughout the, the, all, the meat. Like, you can see those little blisters are getting to the point that they're coming through the skin. All this bloody water liquid was in the belly. It's basically bled to death from the inside pinprick red blood spots seem to be associated with the more diseased, sick-looking fish. Uh, supposedly, bloodshot on the inside of the belly is one of the symptoms of ISA, but we won't know until we actually get test results back what's causing it. Speckly red showing up all through on this one, heart starting to get those blisters all over it. So what disease is that bad that it can cause that? I'm not entirely sure, but hopefully we'll find out. It just goes on and on and on. Things I've never seen before. They're sick. You could see one or two sick fish, but when you see half the fish or more than half the fish in a river that look like they're definitely gonna die before they spawn, it's bad. And all these fish appear to be dead pre-spawn. The legs. So look at all the fish that are here. Look at them all. All dead, all pre-spawn. It's pretty obvious that there's something going on. If you've actually walked any of these rivers or gone fishing, um, I don't think they're all dying necessarily of the same thing, but they're definitely dying of disease. So. 
it's basically all over the province. There is some rivers that seem to be doing better than others, but yeah, the, it's province-wide. So, we definitely should be doing this work now. We should have been doing it for years. Um, it, we need to do something. The rivers are getting less and less fish, and right now people are doing basically nothing. The government's sure not doing it, so mm -hmm. somebody's got to do it. And within, what, 15 minutes, we've found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, just in a tiny section of river, pre-spawn mortality. I haven't seen one that spawned. Have you seen one? So, not one. Viruses are delicate. You gotta get them in cool right away and keep them fresh and... That's why we work so fast. Oh, he's got that uh, columaris. Yes. It is a huge challenge to get these samples to the labs in time, and we need a we need a lab in British Columbia. It's ridiculous. I'm not allowed to use the labs at DFO. I'm not even allowed to talk to them. I mean, I'd like to drive to Nanaimo with these samples right now and put them in a negative 80 freezer in Dr. Miller's lab and have her look at them. She can do 200 fish a day for 40 pathogens. We're going to pay $200 on just this fish for three viruses. I mean, these fish are dying. They have a problem. We're willing to do the lead work and, and, and drive the samples right to the door. We're not even allowed to talk to them. We pay their salaries. These fish are dying out. So we ship them to Norway, which is expensive and time consuming and our, the quality of samples is damaged, but we're not gonna be stopped by closed doors. DFO does not wanna know what this fish died of. If I could track these viruses anywhere as I wanted, I'd go straight to the salmon farms and I'd look in those pens and I'd pick their sick looking fish and I would rush them to the labs, fresh tissue. Because the labs say the fresher, the better in a fish that's actually dying of the disease. Then, then your chance of being able to culture it is much greater. But you know we're not allowed to do that. So this whole search for the virus is being really slowed down. It's being impeded by the lack of ability to go to the farms and test. A friend came to me and goes, you know, you realize there's Atlantic salmon in the supermarkets, but you know, you could test them. It's like, of course, because the farms won't.